She's a lawyer, an advocate, and leader in the community. She's Walla Legay, and she wants to keep you in the know because times are tough and you need answers. Welcome to In the Know with Walla Blagay, where we will explore issues that impact our community. And the issue that we're going to talk about today is labor union. This is a very important contribution to our American society, and I want to talk about it. What is the future of labor unions in America? And this is important because labor unions are tied with the middle class, and that's important. Unions once represent a third of the workforce, and today it only represents 6.4% of the American workforce. That's less than 10%. What happened? History is going to teach us a good lesson of the power of a president, because a president made a huge impact on the history of labor. But before we go to the president, let's go back. Since the early 1900s, unions have been one of the main source in building the middle class. During the early 1900s, America witnessed the biggest industrial revolution where companies like Ford Motors, the railroad companies, hired many unskilled workers. And most of these actually were, were immigrants. I mean, we think about immigrants today, but at that time, it was a massive number of immigrants coming in, especially to New York. Um, this created a very unsafe workplace. Many companies had very unsafe working conditions. Um, we are reminded of the Triangle Shirtwaist Incident in 1911, where teenage women immigrant workers were forced to jump out of a building during a fire because of the unsafe working condition. And that actually led to the formation of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. So you just see how important unions were at this time. Um, many joined unions just to protect themselves from being killed in the workplace. Um, so from the 1920s to the 1960s, the union movement grew tremendously. But then something happened, something changed this. One of the things was the involvement with trade unions and the mafia. Now we've all watched these mafia movies where mafia activities during the 1960s and 70s was revealed that they were involved with many unions such as the Teamsters. We all remember the infamous Jimmy Hoffa and the questioning, grilling by the Attorney General at the time, Robert Kennedy, for his involvement with the mafia. And then he just disappeared. So it just goes to show how, how massive this was in media. Then in 1981, unions were big, dealt the biggest blow. The president, President Ronald Reagan, fired 1,100 air traffic controllers when they decided to strike new nego negotiations. This action was unheard of. Most companies would never fire workers for even, even a threat of a strike would bring, union, would bring management to the table begging for the unions to hold off. But this was a huge defeat. And this, many argued that the unions would never rebound from this defeat because now everyone, every employer looked at the union and said, okay, you're going to strike, we'll just fire you. Another built blow was the automation of jobs. Many manufacturing jobs were replaced with machines, and that was a huge issue, a huge problem. Now, then there was a third um, major defeat for the unions, and this was the automation of many jobs. Um, many jobs were manufacturing jobs. These were assembly line jobs, and these were replaced with machines. I mean, between 2000 and 20, 2010, a study demonstrated that 87% of the manufacturing jobs were replaced with machines. So this is troublesome. Um, and now the union workforce is only around 12% of the American workforce. The only fastest growing industry for unionization is government government workers, and they just received a blow by the Supreme Court. Currently, right now, 34% of the government workers are represented by a union. In a recent support Supreme Court decision, which is Janice, and you would have heard of this, Janice, the Supreme Court ruled that government workers cannot be forced to pay union dues. Um, so this means that a, a union worker can say, okay, this union is working on my behalf, advocating for me, making sure that I have better benefits and better working conditions, but I'm going to be a free writer. I'm not going to pay them anything for their work. This could, this could crush the, the public sector unions. 
Um, so this fight has also impacted the private sector. Um, the concept of right to work. I mean, many of you have probably heard of right to work. And what does right to work mean? Right to work means that a worker can actually be in a union, don't have to pay any dues. And this is a problem because many in those states, 27 states currently have right to work laws in place. And that means that a union can come there, organize, organize, and people will say, I don't want to pay union dues. So how does a union have the resources to do the job that they want to do? They don't have it. So this is continuously breaking down unions that they cannot do what they want to make a difference in the workplace. Earlier we mentioned an important thing. There's a correlation between the middle class and the concept of unionization. The decline of the union started in the 1970s and has always been tied to the decline of the middle class. Why is that important? Because if no middle class, then you don't have the first world society we have. In the 1960s, a CEO earned 20 times the average worker. That was the 1960s, but times change. After the 1960, the decline began. A CEO today owns 376 times more than the average worker. Between 1978 and 2010, the executive compensation has increased by 1,000%. So what is the future of the middle class? Unions no longer present to ensure that a worker gets the fair wages and then improves the working conditions. So many have to rely on minimum wage laws. That's become the biggest issue in every major campaign is about increasing minimum wage. Why? Because no union can negotiate to make sure nobody's working at the minimum wage. So when do we start? When do we actually do something about this? Many argue that stagnant wages is what brought the victory of Donald Trump. And if you think we don't do something like this, if we don't continue to actually address this issue, we're going to see more problems. So what do you have to do? What laws are in your state, in your jurisdiction, that are protecting workers? If you don't have any, if there are not many, then you need to call your representative. And you need to ask them, what are you doing to make a difference for workers? What are you doing to protect a worker in a workplace? You need to call your state representative. You need to also call your federal representative. Where are they on minimum wage? Because minimum wage has not changed on the federal, in the federal, um, federally. It's only changed in many states. We need the actual federal government to do something. So when are they going to do something? And frankly, the difference between a first world country and a third world country is the middle class. So if we do not take efforts and steps to protect the middle class, we will lose the way of life that we know today. So it's really important that we look at this issue and not see this as some sort of history lesson. So I'm actually going to turn to my friend Ed Smith, Executive Director of the DC Nurses Association, but who also has a great show on WPFW called Your Rights at Work, and he's a labor lawyer. And he's going to talk about, he's not only a labor lawyer, but he's an historian. And we're going to go over some of the importance, where is labor today? Where were they in the past? What made the difference? But more importantly, what does the future hold? Now, unions have taken the, the front line in fighting to make sure that we protect workers. But they can't do it alone because at the end of the day, remember, labor is only 6% of the workforce. So that means that the other 94% needs actually a voice. They either need to use their voice and actually start to push for diff issues that can protect us. Um, or, frankly, we need to actually start looking at these presidential candidates. As the 2018 elections are coming up, we're actually asking those in Congress that are coming in, because Congress might change. What are you going to do to protect workers? And more importantly, in this 2020 election, if you have a candidate that is not talking about protecting workers' rights, ensuring that workers improve their working condition and more so increase their wages, then really you're not, we're not, they're not looking to the future. And you should make a decision on who you vote for based on that. But let's hear from Ed who can give us some good, great insight on the status of labor and what the future holds. We are here with a special guest, um, a um, almost a celebrity. 
Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Where is it? How are you today, Walla? Good, good. So, um, this is Ed Smith. With um, he's the executive director of the DC Nurses Association, um, but he's also um, really a labor historian. He knows a lot about the background of labor, and as an executive director, you can speak to what the future holds. I think so. Yeah, right. I think I can make some predictions and things we need to do to strengthen the labor movement. All right. So let's let's go back because we are trying to. People are seeing that things are happening with the labor union, the labor movement, and they're wondering what is the future. You know, labor is not what it was in the early 1900s. So let's talk about that. What was how? What was labor back in the 1920s, 1930s? Okay, so this that's a good question, and labor has you know morphed in many ways. Um, you know, you go back, <clears throat> you go back to the early 1800s. People forget this that women were a big part of labor back then. The mill workers up in Massachusetts, they were women and children, and they fought for, for rights, and sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. Uh, as you move on in the 20s, a lot of the things we take for granted as unions and we complain about uh, today, you didn't have the right to pick it back then. You didn't have the right to go outside a company and hold a picket sign. Not strike, but couldn't even pick it, and you get thrown in jail. You had courts police forces that were all part of uh, uh, the, the, the institutions. And so we complain, we worry about everything. But they fought a lot in the 20s, 30s to get us where we needed to be. Now what changed that allowed the right to pick it and, and the, the rights that many workers have, have enjoyed for a really long time in American history? Well, I, I think that certainly in the 20s, 30s, there was a lot of aggressive um, labor organizers and a lot of people that uh, believed in the labor movement. It was a, a lot of immigrant driven. Um, and over time, uh, that I became kind of the norm. It was okay now to, to pick it and potentially strike. And so laws were passed. 1947, we had a great law passed, and, and, uh, and that gave people the right to strike, the right to organize, and uh, it was taken off from there. And, and of course, the, the 50s saw the 40s and 50s saw the great um, expansion of, of labor into United uh, Mine Workers, United Auto Workers, groups like that, the Teamsters. So a lot of them were uh, making it powerful. You know, I don't know if you know this, but uh, there was a head of the United um, Mine Workers, John Lewis, mm -hmm. who back in the 40s when uh, FDR was president, there was a big serious talk about John Lewis being on the ticket. Wow. With FDR now, as a vice president, as a vice president. Now, can oh, you imagine that now? Not, not. <laughs> Richard Trump got on the ticket with Donald no, Trump, no giving the tweets. Even, right. <laughs> but I mean, even right, even a third party a campaign, you wouldn't see it. And that's that was the power of the unions back then. Interesting. So, what happened? What changed about the labor movement? Um, if we're talking about at one point where a labor leader is on a major ticket. Um, for yeah, and now they can't even get in an op-ed in, right, in the Washington right, Post. Right. If anything, people um, <laughs> avoid them. Um, and right. uh, like, um, I mean, even for Democrats and Republicans, um, at one point, Democrats fully embraced them, and even now, we're finding that Democrats have sometimes distanced themselves from. Labor. Well, you'll find the Washington Post is a great example. Mm -hmm. I have not seen them do an editorial in favor of any teachers' rights issues uh, right. since I've been here, and I've been here since '91. Uh, so the Washington Post is definitely uh, a, a very large institution that right. just simply has nothing good to say about the Washington Teachers Union or the National Teachers Union. So that's, right. that's a good example of how things have changed. Uh, you know, there's so many different factors, Walla, that... Top three. Top three. <laughs> ah, I'm, I'm put on the spot by you. Um, top three, well, certainly um, globalization, yeah. outsourcing. Uh, and explain that. What What do you mean by outsourcing? Because people need to understand sort of what what has happened, especially in American economy. So companies are smart. You know, they're they're they're, they're profit driven, and right. I think they've been more and more and more profit driven uh, right. over the years, or or maybe more successful at the uh, urge to be profit driven. Um, but globalization, basically, a company can take its factory, uh, making you know, garment workers, a good example, making clothes, perfect example. And move it overseas and have somebody, uh, uh, you know, make clothes for fifty cents a day or fifty cents an hour. And when that group 
starts the fight and they want more, well, they just move the company to somewhere else. And uh, so it used to be that clothes were made in America. Now they're not. Right. And we, and we buy it. Right. And we go to Walmart. Right. Uh, and then we complain that our jobs are outsourced. Well, companies are profit-driven. That's interesting. Well, it's almost like what the work of the union had, you know, led. That's the backlash to it, right? Because the know, unions I, made it argue, arguably that's it was their fight that brought those type of requirements for work. That's why a lot of people, and I think the message has been, uh, the uh, uh, United Auto Workers ruined America. You know, right. United yeah. Auto Workers were doing what the United Auto Workers were designed to do, which is protect the rights of their workers and to make sure their workers could have. Uh, have their kids go to college, have a nice home, you know, the, the quote-unquote American dream. Um, and maybe they did make some missteps, but yes, of course, the companies decided, okay, we got to, you know, we got to move things out, 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 out of the country. And then also, at the same time, other countries were producing good cars at a cheaper price. Japan and, uh, is, a, is a perfect example. So a lot of that is uh, really tied into how labor lost some power. Um, I think probably a seminal uh, event was the uh, strike, uh, the uh, 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 air traffic controllers. And let's talk about that because I, I talked about that earlier in this show where mm -hmm. we talked about the power of President Reagan during right. that strike and what it did, what it did for managers and for businesses across America right. towards their relationships with unions. So explain that. Explain what happened and how that, well, how it impacted. Well, so. I don't know how much detail you got into, but in 1981, the workers, uh, air traffic uh, controllers, were in difficult negotiations with management, and they weren't getting a lot of their demands met. Um, and they authorized what was then an illegal strike, basically. I mean, the strike was against the law, um, just like strikes were against the law in the 20s. So they tried to exercise their power. Well, Reagan, uh, Reagan was in a position where he could um, tell them. That's it. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna fight you. And apparently, uh, from what I've read in some sources, is that Reagan did try to reach a, 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 a decent agreement. And by the time I guess those proposals were put forth during mediation, um, the union had gone ready. To, they had been ready to strike. But once they lost that strike, Reagan busted them. And basically, what that means is he replaced those strikers with other people to work. And so they all lost their jobs. They all lost their jobs. Interesting. Um, and that was in 1981. And uh, I had been looking at uh, strike histories uh, to see the data on it. And there's a great there's a great source called uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's BLS, and they uh, they're a great source on anything labor, how much people make, how much unionized make versus non-union. Well, they've got a great table on ch a chart on uh, on strikes, mm -hmm. and you look at it. Major strikes, a thousand people or more every year. How many were there? Well, the last time there was over a hundred was in 1981. Wow, that's I mean that that is an amazing correlation. Yeah. So if that's the case, um, what happened with the labor? Because then there's no strikes. How did that impact the labor movement? So, I think the statistics alone show that there was some sort of impact, and I think for those of us. No, I hadn't been around since 1981. I was alive in 1981, but no, I was not working as a labor lawyer then. But uh, managers, you know, you go right down the line. You go from the CEO up here to managers all the way down the line. It became freer. It became easier to, to flex their muscles and to kind of turn the corner. Plus, the money was flowing a lot more towards uh, management. And as uh, strikes went down... And, of course, union membership went down. It becomes kind of a spiral. And in many respects, it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the union believes, it's, if the union members believe that they're weak and that the union is weak, they're less likely to engage in the strike because if you strike and you're weak, you lose your job. Uh, also, they might be less likely to join a union because they uh, perceive the union as weak. So I think it's become kind of a spiral. Um, and some had argued it was a death spiral. I don't think it's a death spiral. I think no matter what, what happens in the end, workers will always unite, whether they unite under something called the Union, D.C. Nurses Association, or just some group. They're going to fight. 
And so let's go into that because now um, there was a recent Supreme Court, Supreme Court decision. So can you talk briefly about that and how that's impacting the labor movement? Sure. Uh, the decision was called uh, Janus versus AFSCME. AFSCME is a uh, huge union, huge public sector union representing, uh, I'm not sure whether it's a million, but quite a, quite a large amount of workers across the country in the public excuse me, public sector. So uh, Janus was about um, funded. That was the third reason, by the way. The third factor in, in the whole labor movement having problems is there's been a boatload of money right. coming from right-wing groups. Right. National Right to Work Foundation and National Right to Work Committee. Right. The committee was formed in 55, the foundation in 68. Wow. So it was even closer the time, and that probably marked Right, and the money's been pouring in more and more, and, and, and uh, it's tied to the Koch brothers, uh, John Birch Society, Walmart is a big uh, contributor. They've spent $33 million in lobbying activities alone wow. in, in the last uh, 14, 15 years. So mm -hmm. you're talking two, two to three million dollars a year that they're pumping in to just lobbying, just lobbying, not the court case. So the court case, Janus, um, was funded in many respects by the National uh, Right to Work um, Foundation mm -hmm. Committee. Committee handles the legal stuff. Um, and that that lawsuit ultimately was won by the the uh, National Right to Workers and which it said that if I belong to a public sector union I no longer have to belong. I don't have to pay fees. Like I, right now the law, the law was that I didn't have to join the union, but I had to pay a certain fee to the union to make sure uh, that, uh, or to, because the union was uh, negotiating contracts on, on behalf of me, uh, handling grievances. So they were doing a lot of work. The unions did a lot of work for people. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, well, I had to pay some sort of fee uh, for the administration of the contract. Well, that was found unconstitutional just recently by uh, the wonderful Supreme Court of the United States. I think decision was five to four and uh, uh, we think you know of course labor thinks it was wrong but now uh, Wally you're a member of a union that union can no longer make you pay a fee right and so right. You, you will no longer be part of the union um, but we still would have to represent you so that's what that case um, was the impact of that I don't know what the impact will be obviously in the short term people are going to lose money but the federal government's been dealing with this. Federal right. unions have been dealing with this since the inception, right? So, so what is the future of the labor movement? With as you mentioned, globalization has impacted it. Um, the the um, the obviously now let there are less strikes because of um, the 1981 PATCO strike, and then now we're dealing with an actual campaign against unions, right? You're saying 33. The 33 million? Yeah, over a course of 13, over 14 years. 14 years. So it's we're having more now. A, a active, well funded uh, machine fighting against unions. What is the future? I think my, when I was doing, um, when we were looking at some numbers, we're looking at about 6%. Overall, they they were saying that uh, maybe that was private sector. Private Either sector way, is like six point six. 6, 6, 6, 6 yeah, yep, yeah, that's it. So that's private sector, and then now they're coming after the public sector. Now they're coming after yeah. public sector. So we're talking at and now there was a third, and now union membership was up to a third at one point right. in American history. Yeah, and it's back gone down 50s. back in the fifties exactly before the um, before some of the attacks, but it's gone down. So at, at this point, what is the future of labor? What should people be doing? If it's not, you said if it's not labor, it could be, if it's not a union, it could be something else. What is the future? What does the future hold? So that's a big, big, big question. Yeah. It probably could fill a 400, 500-page <laughs> book, right? So I guess my thinking on it, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a half-glass-full kind of guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the most recent things that have happened in the past year or so, just here in D.C., or in the D.C. area. There was a 42-day strike uh, that the Communication Workers of America lodged against Verizon. Mm -hmm. And they won. They won their benefits. They got, and they got additional, um, they obtained additional members uh, in the wireless departments. And this was a regional strike. That was a big strike. And, and the every, public was on their side. Right, including presidential candidates. That's right. Yeah. And then just this past uh, spring, or 
was it last fall? I can't even remember now. But we had basically teachers who were really not big union people in West Virginia, in Colorado, in Arizona, that said, we're going to strike, and did strike, and won benefits in and, and, and right-to-work states. So there's this, oh, labor's dead kind of movement. Well, yeah, they're spending a lot of money to defeat us, and it's been no different than 100 years ago. At least they're not killing us in the streets is what's, what they did. They had Pinkerton guards kill people, beat up people. Now, it could come to that. I don't know. But ultimately, people, when they're pushed back enough, they're going to fight back, and they're going to fight back in this day and age with the strength of a union. Unions are not weak. Unions still have money. Unions still have committed leaders. And the most important thing is unions have members who do the work. Um, it doesn't always mean that you have to strike, but I think the point is, is that people have to realize the power they have. I'm the one doing the work. Management, if I'm not working, management's not making money. So I think that that's important to um, develop the grass work, grassroots. Uh, and then this is something you've done along with other staff. When Janice came down, we went more and more to our members. So it's a good lesson. Right. We've got to go talk to our members. Now, do you think that the, um, the, the, the diminishing uh, membership of unions has led to a lot of the, we see the fight for 15 and a lot of these sort of workers' rights policies that are being pushed in, um, not only locally but nationally. It's becoming a big thing nationally. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, I mean, we even think about health care, maybe the push for employers to cover health care. That would have been something and, that and, wouldn't you need Health care for all, Medicaid, right? Medicare, Medicare for all. Medicare for so all. do you think that that's sort of what's um, sort of uh, going to fill in some of the void of the lacking of union membership? I think that will help union membership and it will help us understand coalitions that we can build together on. You know, you look back in the 68 strike down in Memphis, that was sanitation workers, that was AFSCME. Most people think it was Martin Luther King. You know, if you ask people what about 1968 in Memphis, they probably don't know he was there for a strike. But the fact was, is the church, the and you know SNCC, um, and labor got together, and they ultimately won. That was a long battle. People don't realize that was over a year long fight for you know dignity. Um, so we need to remember that, that, you know, when the fight for 15, uh, we have uh, pastors on our side. We have a lot of groups on our side. In D.C., we passed a great law on the, on the um, sick right. leave, I'm sorry, paid leave. Right. And that was a support Basically. from all coalitions, labor, and that's what we've got to get back to is because by ourselves, D.C.N.A., mm -hmm. by ourselves, representing 2,000 members, is not going to get over on on uh, the the hospital association. Right. It's just that simple. You don't have the money. You don't have the manpower. So you got to figure out ways to to do that. And I think that's where we're starting to see, you know, the, like you said, the the drive for fifteen dollars an hour, um, which is still low, right? Yeah. They said it should Especially be here. with inflation. They said it should be over twenty thousand, over twenty dollars. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I you know, you go to Lincoln, Nebraska, maybe it's a little different, but I. You know, but you got to start somewhere, and right. the thing is, the coalitions have been building, right. and people are on our side, and young people are on our side. Yeah, people yeah. younger than you are really supportive of labor, more so than they've ever been. I think I saw some stat like over sixty-five percent or something of young people believe in a labor movement or believe in the cause of labor. I'm not sure. And, and I can speak. Um, for myself, and I'm a beginning of that generation of millennials, right, but right. frankly, you're dealing with a group that's coming into work without a 401k, without, I mean, without the pension of their parents. Rising the, health care right, costs. Right, rising health care right. costs. We've got student loans. Mm. I think a lot of the things, the things that has been set up for our generation, and even those behind me, has led them to become more, more worker advocates than the generation prior, because now they're feeling like, maybe if I got a little more at work. Yeah. I might be better off. Well, you know, it's kind of like when I was growing up, the anticipation is we're going to do better than, you know, financially better than our fa family. And the same was with you, but it's starting to fade. And now people do not expect to do right. better than mom and dad. 
Right. So they'll be living with mom and dad for a long time. So guess what? You yep. better organize. Right. right. You better right. stand up for yourself. So you guys and, hear it from yeah. from, you the, see from it. an expert. Yeah. Organize. And, <laughs> and you see it from you know you saw it from kids in Parkland. Right. You see it from 18, 19 year old kids, and that is that's the future of labor, right. really. And we've got to make sure that we listen. Us older people got to listen. And as you get older, you got to keep listening and delivering on what helping them understand how 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 the pitfalls and then the strategies that can get the victories. But I think they already see. I think they already know it in many respects. So in in ways we're repeating history. You think that this is going to lead to Cyclical, the same movement, movement of the early nineteen hundreds? Ah. I would like to see it more like the 30s and 40s where we weren't getting beat up so much. Right, <laughs> but right. but yeah. I hope so. Um, you know, I, I, to me, whether we're at 7%, 12%, 30%, I'm not sure that matters. What I think matters is the day-to-day -day struggles and to make sure that we, uh, our members are in solidarity and believe that they have power and believe they can make a difference. That's all that matters. The numbers will come later, but it's about your rights right there in the workplace, whether you can make a difference. And once you believe you can make a difference, that's it. You've won, in All my right. opinion. Well, you heard it from a, a, an expert. Um, times are changing, and don't um, let it no, that don't one out. <laughs> um, times are changing, and what we might see, what we might see is a door closing. There's a door opening, and that might lead to more organizing. Um, and a new generation that sees it in a different way. So um, always tune in to In the Know with Walla Blagay on the Gum Network, and we will keep you informed. Thank you for watching. <laughs>